Assalamu alaikum. Thank you everyone for attending. In this session, we're going to be talking about robotics and AI and how this process will revolutionize our working environments. They will be definitely impacting our jobs and industries. In the next 10 to 20 years, the workforce is expected to be consistent of both machines and humans working together. In this session, we will examine how this emerging relationship will impact specifically patents, intellectual property, and law. We will also be talking about how such technological advancements will empower employees and decision-making in companies. To welcome our first guest, Professor Ryan Abbott, who is a professor of law and health sciences at the University of Surrey. He's also an adjunct professor at UCLA School of Medicine. He has published extensively on the issue of associated with, uh, he has published extensively on the issues associated with law, technology, and intellectual property. He's going to be talking about how machines are going to in change the way we file patents in the future. Please. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here to speak about this with you today. In our first session this morning, Professor Levy, who did a very entertaining artistic work, which I couldn't possibly compete with, got asked the question, who should own something like this? Or who should own something when an AI makes something? And he said, well, why do we need to own it? Th which is the sort of answer you might get out of an artist. But I'm a lawyer, so you're going to get a different sort of question for me. Because that may work sometimes when you're doing art installations that are one-off projects. It may work less well when you are making the next Avengers movie or designing a new drug. Artificial intelligence generated inventions or copyrightable works, AI generated works are having a moment right now. So the US Patent and Trademark Office has just opened a notice for comments and they're looking to create a new policy on this sort of thing. But people have been reporting that AI has been doing this for a long time and there's really no law about it anywhere in the world. And it's not just one-off academics who are claiming things are, are making AI-generated inventions. These may be part of fairly mainstream AI models like Watson. So this is a picture of Watson's avatar winning a game of Jeopardy in um, 2011, practically ancient history in AI development terms. Watson's business insights model now has clients giving big data to IBM. IBM runs the data through Watson. Watson produces insights. These insights belong by contract to clients, and the clients can go on to patent the insights. But it's not clear when something like that happens who the inventor is or whether there's an inventor. So the client giving big data over to IBM isn't an inventor. They're just commissioning research. IBM isn't an inventor. A company can't be an inventor. Maybe the people who ask Watson to solve a problem or feed it the data, but only if that requires inventive skill. Maybe the people who program Watson, but Watson can have dozens or hundreds or thousands of programmers who may be programming Watson without an expectation of the specific problems it's going to go on to solve. And maybe the people who recognize the importance of the inventive output might be inventors, particularly if Watson comes up with a hundred different things they have to choose between. But if Watson creates output that is fairly self-explanatory, that wouldn't make someone an inventor either. At least some of the time, what we traditionally think of as the conceptual act of devising an invention that qualifies someone to be inventors seems to have been done by AI. Not most of the time, fairly rarely, most of the time AI is just a tool that helps us invent. The same sort of way um, a calculator program on my app can help me to invent by facilitating basic tasks. The same sort of way Microsoft PowerPoint can help me design this program. But some of the time, it goes further along the spectrum and acts in autonomous sorts of ways. And when you have a person do those things, if I train my PhD student to solve complex problems, and she does, I'm not an inventor on her patents. I don't have any claim to having devised the final invention. So if I just ask Siri to invent something and it does, well, that would make Siri an inventor. At least it would if it was a natural person. There's never been a case that has challenged this, although people have said AI has been doing this since the early 80s. 
a group I'm working with now has just filed the first two patent applications internationally claiming an AI-generated invention where no human qualified as an inventor and listing the AI as the inventor and the AI's owner as the owner of the patent applications and eventual patents. Those patents were filed in the uh, European Patent Office and the UK Patent Office. The UK and European Patent Offices said they were novel, inventive, and industrially applicable, which are the requirements to get a patent anywhere in the world. They hadn't yet decided the inventorship issue, and we've also filed this worldwide as a PCT application, so we're filing this in additional jurisdictions, and there's really no law on what to do about it. Almost every jurisdiction has a law that says an inventor has to be a natural person, but those are laws that date back decades, and they were done to protect the moral rights of human inventors. Because most patents are filed by companies, but there was a concern that companies would file patents and the people who worked on them wouldn't be acknowledged. So those rules were made to allow companies to be, inventor, to be patent owners, but not to cut human inventors out of being acknowledged. It doesn't really work so well when you think about AI-generated invention. There's a lot of different ways AI can do things like this. The system we worked with is a neural network-based machine, so at its most simple iteration, it's just two neural networks. A neural network stores data that it's been exposed to in the form of altering connection weights between neurons. So you train a neural network with data, the neural network perturbs or alters its own connection weight somewhat randomly, and this corrupts the data it's seen. And this results in new information coming out of the network that it's never been exposed to. You train a second neural network, a critic neural network, that it has something to look for coming out of the first one, and so the first neural network will start generating novel information, and the second neural network will look at the first and evaluate what's coming out of it. That was something this machine was doing back in the 1990s, and in its current iteration, it has thousands of neural networks working together, each neural network encoding for a conceptual space. So A may stand for the concept of an academic, B for a lecture, C being very boring, D for escaping, E may be a whole separate idea. You can escape out of a window, but that can lead to death. And then another concept being a flying device can help you to escape from great height. And so this may be a new use of a flying device to escape a boring academic lecture out a window, thereby avoiding death. Neural networks aren't the only ways. Machines can generate new information people have never seen before. Genetic programming is a whole other way of designing an AI that does this. This is a type of software that alters its own code using processes mimicking natural evolution. So the code mutates and um, combines with other code and alters itself in search of a solution to a problem. Sometimes the problem can be pretty general, but in 1990, John Koza designed what he called an invention machine using genetic programming. It developed a new controller, which is an engineering device. He specified a few basic criteria the thing should have, gave it publicly available schematics, and the genetic programming uh, took it from there until it made something that eventually received a patent on it. Without laws talking about what we should do with AI-generated inventions, there's a whole lot of outstanding legal issues with what to do about this. Can you patent an AI-generated invention? Who would be an inventor or what would be an inventor? And who would own it or what would own it? And these are ideas that are becoming, or challenges that are becoming increasingly important. You saw this morning some examples of AI doing interesting artistic things, writing books, making video games, making artwork. It's been doing that for decades. The difference is that it's getting better at doing it. And not quite human competitive most of the time, but getting close. And Inventing things is lagging a bit behind generating creative work, but even if AI inventions are a novelty today, in five or 10 years, they may be a really significant economic phenomenon. There isn't really any law on the patent side, but there is some law on the copyright side. So patents are things that new inventions get, and copyright are things that belong to new creative works like books and movies and video games. Um, this is something made by Google's Deep Dream Generator. The United Kingdom has the very first law on AI-generated works for copyright. That dates back to 1988. And the law says that the producer of an AI-generated work is the owner of it and deemed the author, a producer in the same sense as a film producer. So if you're the person who 
undertakes to have an AI generate something new that would receive copyright if it was a person, you are considered the author and the work receives copyright. The US has a different approach. The US Copyright Office has said an AI-generated work cannot receive protection. And that's not a statute, it's a policy of the Copyright Office. And they're citing to the, 19, or the 1886 case of Burrow Giles v. Cerrone in support of that policy. That was the case that held that a photograph could receive copyright. In that case, Oscar Wilde's uh, well-known photograph was infringed by the Burrow Giles Lithographic Company. The company said, you can't copyright a photograph because it's just a natural reproduction um, or it's just a reproduction of a natural phenomenon. And the court said, well, even though a camera is involved in this, it's just a tool, and really any sort of creative work brought about by mental activity could be protected. So that case back in the 19th century was dealing with whether a camera could be an author or whether using a camera negated ownership of something like this. And now, more than 100 years later, the Copyright Office is using this to say, AI-generated work shouldn't be protected. Well, there are some problems with that approach. Um, for starters, if you are using an AI to make something valuable, particularly if an AI is the best way to make something valuable, you want copyright protection on it, you can't get protection in the US, um, at least under this policy. And it makes it awfully tempting to represent that you have done something instead of an AI. The case came up more recently, or the policy came up a little more recently as a result of the monkey selfies. So this was a series of pictures taken by a crested macaque of itself in Indonesia using equipment belonging to the UK nature photographer David Slater. Mr. Slater um, saw the pictures of the monkey, tried to commercialize them, and other people started using them without his permission. A public debate arose about whether you could own copyright in animal-generated art, whether he owned it, whether the monkey owned it. The Copyright Office clarified that no, only humans can own copyright, and the issue seemed to go away. And then PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, sued on the monkey's behalf in the US, alleging that the monkey should be the copyright owner, and they should help administer it on his behalf. This case was eventually tossed out by the Court of Appeals in California, or the Federal Court of Appeals based in California. That court said that the monkey didn't have standing to sue because Congress hadn't authorized animals to sue under the Copyright Act. So they never got at the substantive merits of this policy, but that's how it stands now. In the US, if an AI generates something in which no human would serve as an author, you can't protect it, and in the UK, you can. So now we're doing a test case to see, well, how is this gonna work with patents? And historically, people have said, you don't need patents for AI-generated inventions because machines are not motivated to invent by the prospect of a patent. In the US and the UK, we primarily grant patents as an innovation incentive. Surprisingly, this even shows up within the US Constitution, which says Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by allowing inventors to have patents, essentially. And while it is true that machines are not responsive to patent incentives, the people who build AI, own AI, and use AI are responsive to patent incentives. And so allowing AI-generated inventions to receive protection would result in more investment and development of inventive AI, which would ultimately lead to more invention. So allowing these works to be protected would facilitate the underlying purpose of patent law and it would also help to avoid a weird situation where a company has a choice, Pfizer has a choice between using Watson or DeepMind to help with drug discovery or a team of human researchers, and they have to use the human researchers because that's the only way they could get a patent. Also, we think that the uh, AI itself should be listed as the inventor as a matter of fairness. Not that it would be fair to a machine or that a machine has any interest in fairness, but it would be unfair to other human inventors to allow people to claim credit for the work of machines. It would equate serious human invention with me asking a machine to solve a problem. Of course, AI would not own patents. Um, AI is owned as property. It doesn't have legal personhood. It doesn't have any moral interest and wouldn't be incentivized by this. So, Obvious options for people who would own a patent would be the owner of the AI, the user of the AI, or the developer of the AI, and we're proposing that the owner of the AI should own any patents that it creates. That's 
most likely to have the right innovation incentive effect, and it least interferes with the transfer of public property or private property. AI-generated invention, while right now a bit of a novelty, is likely to be really disruptive in the medium term because AI is quickly improving and people are not. And patent law has standards that are based on human activity this is going to challenge. So for a person to receive a patent, you primarily need three things for an idea. It has to be new, it has to be inventive, and it has to be industrially applicable. And the primary barrier to getting a patent is this requirement for it to be inventive. Something has to be non-obvious compared to what came before. And that's a difficult, tricky thing to decide. Uh, but essentially, we have this theoretical tool called the person having ordinary skill in the art. A court asks, well, what would an average researcher have found obvious? So if you have a slight variation on an existing chemical that an average researcher would have known to do, you can't get a patent on it. If it was something unexpected, an average person wouldn't have thought to do, then you would be able to get a patent on it. Incidentally, I chose a picture of London commuters being based in London myself to represent the average researcher, and this is the happiest looking picture of London commuters I could find on the internet. Well, AI is really going to change this because as AI continues to improve, it's not just going to be a novelty, it's going to be incorporated into mainstream R&D. And at some point, at least in some areas, AI is likely to become the standard way that R&D is done. So particularly in areas where uh, tasks AI excels at are so important. For example, finding new uses of existing drugs. One of the ways that is done is by recognizing patterns in large data sets, say from insurer records or government records or hospital records, and AI may have a significant advantage over people at doing this. AI is already being used in large part to identify new drug targets, to model drug-drug interactions, to find antibodies that target antigens well, and these are activities that when a human inventor used to do it would qualify for a patent. Well, now AI is doing these sorts of things. And as AI becomes the standard way that these things are done, AI is really going to have to represent the standard researcher. When it does, a lot less is going to be non-obvious to an AI because these AIs will be more knowledgeable and more sophisticated than average researchers. And so it's going to raise the bar to patentability as eventually people and machines come into closer competition with generating IP. In 1997, when IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess, he had an insight. He thought, okay, so a machine can always beat a person at chess now, but I bet that a person and a machine could do better playing together than they could independently. After all, human grandmasters are very good at thinking far ahead, chess programs are not, but chess programs can model millions of moves per second, and human grandmasters can't do that. He wasn't entirely the first to have the idea, but the following year, he placed first in the first human centaur chess tournament where a person and a machine play together. Indeed, a person and a machine could beat a person playing alone, but they also ended up beating a machine playing alone because they did complement each other. And so people did better being augmented by AI than someone could do themselves or a machine could do themselves. And that was true to a point. Because in 2017, the same year that um, DeepMind's AlphaGo program beat the world's best Go player, the chess engine Zor beat the world's first human plus centaur chess team. So eventually, people may just get in the way. Thank you.